Hello everybody and welcome back to the Little Woman podcast. Ever since I made the episode Love and Sex in Little Woman in the first season, I've had people asking me about lovemaking scenes between Joe and Friedrich and Amy and Laurie and Meg and John. One of my friends recently posted that she doesn't think that Laurie was in love with Joe. It was more about his sexual awakening. I agree with this because in the book he wants to hook up with Joe without any kind of projection for the future. Even when he proposes he doesn't have any kind of future planned for them. When he is in Vienna composing an opera and his mind creates the imaginary woman that is continuous to his sexual awakening. But when he begins to think about Amy and the fantasy woman starts to look like Amy That is when Laurie begins to fall in love with the real Amy and actually begins to think about the future. I think it is remarkable because Little Woman is also about Joe's sexual awakening with Friedrich and Amy's sexual awakening with Laurie. It is remarkable because in the 19th century when Little Woman was written you weren't allowed to speak about sex in general and such things like female sexuality was a complete taboo. And one of the reasons why A Little Woman Part 2 was seen somewhat suspicious in some circles was because the book pretty openly portrayed Joe's sexual awakening with Frederick. I'm going to read you a fanfiction story written by Osqueen. Last year, Osqueen gave me a permission to read all her Little Woman fanfics in this podcast, so you can expect more of these in the coming seasons. The Little Woman fanfiction community has been most generous, providing material for this podcast. Some of you have been asking, will I be reading Amy and Laurie fanfics in the future? I would love to do that, I just need to find some nice Amy and Laurie fanfics and ask the writers a permission to read them aloud. I would also like to include some pet fanfictions and John and Meg fanfictions, but those are not that easy to find. The story that I chose for you today is lovely. It has lots of references to transcendentalism, to Goethe and German romanticism, and Osqueen has done their homework, and I love it. They are very knowledgeable about the historical origins of this couple. Then to the promotional part, if you would like to learn a new skill to paint, to write, or take better Instagram photos, you can have one free month on Skillshare, link is in the description. And if any of you are interested on literary analysis, and I think some of you are if you are listening to this podcast, I have a new course on Skillshare about uh, fairy tale origins. And you can also find my course through that link. Before we get into this lovely fanfic, I will read you one of those Joe's sexual awakening moments written by Louisa May Alcott in 1868. And as usual, I believe that this is actually written about Henry David Thoreau. This is from the chapter Surprises when Freddy comes to court Joe. Quote, He seldom spoke to Laurie, but he looked at him often, and a shadow would pass across his face, as if regretting his own lost youth, as he watched the young man in his prime. Then his eyes would turn to Joe so wistfully that she would have surely answered, the mute inquiry if she had seen it, but Joe had her own eyes to take care of, and feeling that they could not be trusted, she prudently kept them on the little sock she was knitting, like a model maiden ant. A steady glance now and then refreshed her, like sips of fresh water after a dusty walk, for the sidelong peep showed her several propitious omens. Mr. Bear's face had lost the absent-minded expression, and looked all alive with interest in the present moment. Actually young and handsome, she thought, forgetting to compare him with Laurie, as she usually did with strange men, to their great detriment. Then he seemed quite inspired, though the burial customs of the ancients, to which the conversation had strayed, might not be considered an exhilarating topic. So quite glowed with triumph when Teddy got squenched in an argument and thought to herself, as she watched her father's absorbed face, how he would enjoy having such a man as my professor. 
as my professor. As my professor. As my professor. To talk with every day. Lastly, Mr. Bear was dressed in a new suit of black, which made him look more like a gentleman than ever. His bushy hair had been cut and smoothly brushed, but didn't stay in order long, for in exciting moments he ramped it up in the troll way he used to do, and Joe liked it rampantly erect, better than flat, because she thought it gave his fine forehead a Joe-like aspect. Poor Joe, how she did glorify that plain man, as she sat knitting away so quietly, yet letting nothing escape her. Not even the fact that Mr. Bear actually had goat sleeve buttons in his immaculate wristbands. Dear old fellow, he couldn't have got himself up with more care if he had been going wooing, said Jo to herself. And then a sudden thought born of the words made her blush so dreadfully that she had to drop her ball and go down after it to hide her face. End quote. In the episode Love and Sex in Little Woman, I talked about the 19th century courting rituals. As silly as it sounds, one of them was shared looks, because people weren't supposed to share their attraction to one another in public. They had to try to show their interest in much more nuanced ways. And this scene is really a reprise of the chapters Joe's journal and friend, where she also goes into long details describing how she thinks that in her eyes Professor Bear is very attractive. This is Small Umbrella in the Rain, a little woman podcast, a dramatic reading for all good ends. For good ends, my old queen, what is transcendentalism without some discreet outdoor tumbles? The river is slow and green, flecked with dandelion fluff and willow catkins. The water rippling where the fish notch for insects. Cho watches the water, the sun on her back, Friedrich's chest, warm and firm under her cheek. The remnants of their picnic have been pushed to the edges of their blanket, and the birds are watching for any opportunity to steal clothes and snatch crumbs. Friedrich's fingers play lazily against Joe's back, tracing a seam in her dress, rubbing across the fraying stitches of a hasty patch at her waist, following a folded wrinkle in the chemise beneath. Joe makes a sleepy sort of noise, which he echoes in soft agreement. Sleep. Sleep, he murmurs contently. Great nature's second course. For a moment she feels his hand leave. Leave her back as he gestures to the scene before them. She tips her head against his shoulder to look up at him. You cannot possibly be so wary, she says, trying not to laugh. You snored from the moment the light went out to the moment the birds roused you. I snore, he asks, only pretending to be surprised. Like a bear, Joe says, I smite. He laughs heartily, and the birds take fright at the noise. Joe laughs too, resting her cheek down against his shoulder, but still watching him, watching the lines on his face deepen in his delight, the way his eyes shine at her. Joe, he says, and he raises her hand, to his mouth and kisses her palm and it seems the most natural thing in the world to kiss him and to move her body on top of his skirt scattering around her knees her stockings sliding down and wrinkling 
as she levers herself above him. His next words are lost in the gentle gasp of breath he makes against her mouth, and she shifts the angle of her hips, and through his clothing she can feel his body responding to her sudden closeness. She smiles and offers a gentle bite to his lip. I thought you were tired. He only hums and kisses her again, his hand sliding under her skirts to rest on her thigh. Joe glances over the top of his rumpled hair towards the lane, but they are hidden by green leaf trees and the long grass rippling in the breeze, white flowers popping their heavy heads. Frederick leans towards her, popped on one elbow, his right hand slowly working at her buttons. She shifts her weight again and watches his lashes flutter, his fingers hesitating a moment as he draws a careful measured breath. When his hands slip inside the front of her dress to cup her breast, his skin hot through the thin cotton of her chemise, she leans towards him and kisses him, her fists scattering in the front of his shirt, her knees sliding further apart on the blanket beneath him. He makes a breathless sort of noise and arches under her, his thumb rubbing over her nipple. She is impatient for more, but she has long since known that there are few acceptations to the rule of anticipation and suspense, making for a more satisfying finish. She rolls her hips slowly and feels the friction of clothing pulling between her legs. Friedrich's hands go seeking further beneath her skirts, but she catches them, laces her fingers through his and leans forward, pinning him in place, hips still rocking slowly. Wait, she breathes, and he gaps out a laugh and falls back. In an almost infinite amount of things, Friedrich's patience outweighs her own, but not this. Joe, he says, shifting beneath her. He presses his hips up to hers. Not yet, she says, breathless, giddy with the idea of making him wait. He makes a low groan in the back of his throat and closes his eyes, his fingers tightening through hers. She leans into his hands and rolls her hips in a slow circle again, clothing sliding over her, just so. She breathes out of sight and arches her back, rocking against him no faster, but with deeper intent, knowing how to move against him to gain the most feeling, the most pleasure. She can feel him through his trousers, hard and hot, and she is wet and trembling without a touch beyond the friction of her own making. His voice is so rough. Joe, he gaps, please. No, no, not yet, she says, though she's sure she's almost pushed his patience to the limit. Sure that he will tear his hands from her grip at any moment and roll her over and pin her to the blanket. She wants to see how far she can take him without a union of the flesh. She wants to undo him without the bare touch of her skin. She hears him gasp something in German, and she laughs breathlessly and grins down against him again, rolling her hips in slow circles. The sun shines down on her shoulders and the top of her head, and the breeze plays against the light fabric of her chemise. grass and wilderness, rippling gently around her. She looks down at Frederick, who has his eyes closed against all of this. There is a line creased between his brows. His cheeks are flushed, and she can see sweat gleaming at the hollow of his throat. She squeezes his hands. Look at me, she says, and he blinks his eyes, his breath still coming in deep grasp of desperation. 
He brings her hand to his mouth again. She feels the hum of moan against her palm, and his tongue licks over her skin, teasing thoughts of other acts and sending a raw shock down her spine. Please, please, he says again, closing his eyes as she wraps herself over the hot length of him. No, no, wait, she whispers, heat radiating through her body in rolling waves, warmer and warmer, beating to something bigger and stronger. He sucks two of her fingers into his mouth, wet and hot, and she feels another shock race through her, dragging her closer to the inevitable finish line. The front of her dress still gapes open, and Friedrich rasps his hands into the front of her chemise and pulls her close to him, kissing her with rough impatience. His other hand grasps her hip, following her rolling movement once, twice, and then urging her down upon him with more force, more direction, his own hips rocking up into hers. Joe, he groans, please, now please. Yes, she says, her breath caught in her throat. Yes, now, now. Friedrich moans against her mouth, his body shuddering under hers, his fingers tightening on her waist and in the soft fabric of her chemise. Satisfaction crashes over her like a wave, without hope of resistance, heat rolling from the center of her body to the tips of her fingers. The air seems to still. The sun grows warmer, the birds fall silent. She cups Friedrich's face in her hands and kisses his forehead. His hands fall to her waist, gentle and pliant now. He slides his arms around her and eases himself back down onto the blanket, pulling her with him. She tucks her head under his chin and lets her weight settle upon him, her heart thundering in her ears, his chest still rising and falling with rapid breath. A peaceful afternoon, hmm, Friedrich says, once he has finally caught his breath, his fingers once again trail up and down on her back. That is what you promised me. She closes her eyes, the sun warm through the back of her dress, the scent of green grass heavy in the air. A peaceful afternoon, she asks. Are you sure that is what I said? That doesn't sound like me at all, Fritz. He laughs. This is true. His hand smooths over her back. Then I must believe that all this teasing and waiting fuss for revenge. She dips her head back to look at him with a grin, squinting against the sun. Revenge? Surely not. You do not even attempt to look innocent. He accuses. You take this out on your poor husband because he snores like a bear. Joe gives a loud peal of laughter, and he grabs her tightly and rolls her over, pinning her to the blanket, laughing with her, kissing her face and her neck and the palms of her hands. And, he says, looking down at her fondly, we are even. For now, perhaps, Joe says, trying to sound stern, but try and snore again tonight and we see what happens to you tomorrow. He laughs and kisses her again. Promises, promises, he says. Here are the writer's notes. Quote, the title is taken from an essay by George Christoph Dobler, often attributed to Goethe, titled Die Natur, which contains so many potentially punny titles, it is unfair. The opening line is Nature, we are surrounded and embraced by her, powerless to separate ourselves from her, and powerless to penetrate beyond her. In the end, I went with something much, something much shorter and safer, but much shortling was had over some of the other potential choices. Thank you so much for listening. Take care and make good choices. Bye. Mm-hmm.